So we've begun and I am delighted to invite you to this sukkah. How many of you is the first time you've studied in a sukkah? Okay, looks like just about everyone. So let me say a brief word about, um, about this temporary hut that we erect as part of fulfilling the holy day of the festival, the pilgrimage festival um, known as Sukkot in the Hebrew scriptures. And it's instructed that the Israelites will make pilgrimage several times a year and um, come join us and um, stay and create this temporary structure in which they'll eat and sleep and study and, um, and recognize the um, fragility of being amidst the elements. And we're definitely gonna experience the elements here today and be reminded uh, among other things of all the manifold blessings that we have, including for many of us, homes and more permanent shelters and to inspire us and remind us to work on behalf of all those who need shelter and sanctuary and refuge that's more secure and stable and that that's part of our social justice obligation. So there's three things you do in the sukkah in, in the eight days that it's up and one of them is to simply sit and dwell in the sukkah. One of them is to, um, to study in the sukkah, to learn uh, together. And another is to um, shake the uh, four species that are brought together and are stuck in my daughter's backseat park. So I'll have to show you those on Thursday. Um, remind me to, to introduce the Lulav and the Etrog to you on Thursday. So welcome to the sukkah and um, whenever people encounter uh, something for the first time, there's a blessing. The blessing is thanks be to the creator who has kept us alive and sustained us and enabled us three different things to help us be here now in this moment in this time. So it's a first for you all and it's appropriate then to say that blessing. Um, Blessed are you creator who has kept us alive and sustained us and enabled us to get here and be here now. So uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you our special guest, Magid Eli Andrew Romer, who, um, as I shared with you in class, is one of the um, authors and imaginary visionaries of what it, it could look like if our, our Jewish spirituality was queered and that He's given us new texts, new um, tropes and poetry and legends to pass on, both to nourish us in our generation and also to pass on to new generations. He's written and contributed to the queer prayer book that some of you are familiar with from community and that we, um, that we study. And he's prolific, he'll tell you, what edition um, he's on with generating stories and books. And, um, and he, his title, Magid, means storyteller. So he's like in our tradition, an ordained storyteller with magical gifts and powers. And so without further ado, entertain us with your magic. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Oh, well, it's nice to be here with all of you in this lovely space in this very strange time. And this book that I'm going to be reading from is called Texting with Angels, Modern Jewish Tales of Magic and Mystery. 
It's the fifth in a series of queer Jewish storybooks. The first is called Queering the Text. And it has an intro that was written by Rabbi Angel and one other rabbi. And when I was ordained in 2012 publicly, it was by uh, Rabbi Angel. I know you like so, to talk with your hands, but can you try holding that and talking again? No, I'm too Jewish. I can't. Talk. I'm from New York. Okay. I'm going to try to do this. But Does it make know. any difference? Not really. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Even if that wasn't true, thank you. Because I'm not good. I hold them stuff. So I want to read you some stories. The subtitle of all of my books, if it was up to me, would all be bedtime stories for grown-ups. So you know, why is it only little kids get read to? I don't know. But if you're in a relationship and you haven't, start reading each other's stories. Oh, one more thing. The cover of all of these five books, the art on the cover was done by a friend of mine, Anne Marguerite Herbst who owns a really wonderful art gallery out on Taravel and 40th is called FOG, which stands for Far Out Gallery. And if you're ever wandering out toward the beach and wanna look at beautiful art, look up the gallery, see what's there. There are always wonderful shows. Well, greetings. So a story. called Forget and Forgive. This is very disconcerting to look at myself. So <laughs> I may have to do this. Uh, Eli, can you just wait one more moment? Utterly. We have two more people Great. joining us in the front because it is a little hard to hear. OK. And it's not in, it's only better if you talk right into it. Okay, I will do that. Like right into it, just like in the old days with Sharzov. Okay, so how is this? Even more. Even more. How is that? Much okay, better, I don't know how. So if you're not hearing me, don't be shy, like make noises. I'll be looking down so I may not see your hands. Just say louder. Mm -hmm. Oh, since I'm from New York, just say louder. Forget and forgive. I'm sorry, Nikina. It's all right, Oriel, really. No, it isn't. How will you ever forgive me? It's no big deal. I wish I hadn't mentioned it. Can we just forget about the whole thing, please? The two of them were sitting side by side, wings wrapped around themselves on a promontory in a large garden right on the border between second and third heaven. From there, the view in both directions was spectacular. A sparkling river of light, shimmering peaks, a rippling silver aura above them. How about if I take you out for dinner tonight? Oriel, let's forget about it. It wasn't even a big birthday. You're right, Nicanor, and I did remember your last thousandth. Yes, you did do it. And you really were surprised by the party, weren't you? Yes, and I loved it. So let's just forget about this one. I mean, we're not getting any younger. When I wake up in the morning, I still feel the way I did when I emerged from the heart of God. But then I get up and look in the mirror and me too, Nicanor. It seems like only yesterday that I emerged one spark of light in the midst of countless others, humans, souls, and angels, all of us rising up together, then soaring off to meet our different destinies. Sometimes I envy those humans 
it's so simple for them. They soar, they circle, and then they embody somewhere. They don't have to figure out if they're going to be good angels or bad angels like we do. They get to be both good and bad. And if they don't like the way that they did it, they die and get the chance to embody and try it all over again. Oriel turned to look at McCainer and spread its left wing tip out toward the tip of McCainer's right wing, tentatively. For an instant, McCainer pulled back, still irritated. But then its heart opened up and it reached its tip out to meet Oriel's wing tip, where the wings touched liquid light poured from tip to tip, radiant and golden. I promise I'll remember next year, McCainer. I really will. I'm not sure I want you to. Why don't you wait till it's my next thousandth? Why don't we go up to fourth heaven for a while to celebrate? I'd like that. Good, but don't you think we should get going? Oh my God, you're right. We have little wobbly planet Earth to attend to. And then that meeting with our supervisors, standing taking in the glorious view one last time. The two opened wide their shimmering golden wings and sailed off into the infinite expanse of liquid light that is second heaven's lambent and embracing sky. And have you ever met any angels? You might. Perhaps it'll be one of these two. The oldest man in town. Moisha Fagelman, a gem cutter, was traveling alone by night in a small horse-drawn carriage from Warsaw to Kiev on business and was at last on the final leg of his journey. A childless widower about to turn 60, dressed in European clothing, a small yarmulke beneath a yarmulke or kippah beneath his hat. He enjoyed the cities he traveled to and the merchants and wealthy customers he met in each place. He liked chatting with people, listening to their stories. And after traveling alone for some time, he was pleased just after sunset when the driver stopped at a small tavern to change horses and an older gentleman in a long, dark coat got on. But after a single exchange of good evening, the older man turned away, did not reply to Fagelman's inquiry as to his destination, and did not speak again. With no one to talk to, Fagelman rested his head in his hands, balding head beneath his hat, filled with thoughts of dinner at the familiar tavern in Kiev that was the end point of his journey. A small Jewish tavern owned by relatives of his dear late wife, Fania. He could see it in his mind eye, could taste the bread and cheese and wine they always offered him on his arrival, and could feel the soft feather bed he would soon be sinking into. In that swaying carriage, the horse's hoofs clomp clomping, Fagelman was lulled into a half sleep, sheltered, contained, like a child in its mother's womb, drifting and floating on the edge of dreaming. All the way, rocking and jolting beside that old man on the single narrow seat, Fagelman felt strange. Although it was a humid summer night, there was a deadly chill in the carriage and a faint smell of something unpleasant that Fagelman couldn't identify, a bit like rotten cheese. The old man, his collar drawn up over his face, sat motionless, staring through the open window into the darkness. Then, late in the night, as the team of horses plodded on, as the moon rose full in the sky, the darkly cloaked stranger leaned toward Fagelman and asked him if he had the time. 
Reaching down into his waistcoat to retrieve the new pocket watch he was especially proud of, Fagelman was caught off guard when his traveling companion lunged at him, burying long spike teeth in his throat. But then, just before the vampire had a chance to drain poor Fagelman of his lifeblood, the carriage hit a large stone on the road and shuddered, throwing Fagelman to the floor and the vampire to the opposite end of the seat. The door flung open, the carriage came to a halt, and Fagelman scrambled out and darted into the dark surrounding forest, his body surging, his mortal heart racing. He could hear the fading sound of the older gentleman yelling at the coachman as he fled. The sound of leaves and branches crunching beneath his boots was like thunder. He knew about vampires, that he could have been killed, and ran with wild exuberance in his limbs, ran like a child through silver shafts of angled moonlight. Panta, afraid to stop running even when he knew that the old man wasn't following him, Fagelman made his way through the woods to the nearest small town. With no baggage but his money purse and gems in his pocket, Fakelman took a room for the night above a tavern at the edge of town, but was too agitated to sleep for long and kept waking, his heart surging in his chest, light of the full moon streaming through the shutters. The next morning, he set off in another carriage, which arrived in Kiev around four in the afternoon. As the sun began to set that evening alone in a tiny room he had rented for the week, as darkness welled up around him, Fagelman began to gasp for breath. Terrified, he groped for the single lit candle beside his bedside and lit it in a desperate panic. And there began a dawning awareness of his transformed existence. He knew with certainty that night that the jolt of the carriage had spared him death, but that it had put into his body enough of the old man's venom to turn him into a vampire himself. A strange immortal creature, neither dead nor really still alive. And what a terrible life it was. For while the other kind of vampires sleep soundly in their coffins all throughout the day, Fagelman discovered during that second night of his new existence that darkness is deadly for a Jewish vampire, that a Jewish vampire can never sleep at all. Instead, from that time on, Fagelman sat up all night thinking and thinking and reading. You can imagine how difficult it was for him in those first few years being a Jewish vampire. For us, the day begins at sunset, not sunrise. So Fagelman the vampire had to miss the shared beginning of every Sabbath, the start of every single holiday, for fear of going to a place where the candles might blow out, leaving him gasping in darkness. But modern, Technology has made the world a safer place for him. Electric lights have banished night from our lives. Although, just to be safe, whenever he goes out now after dark, Fagelman carries two small battery-operated flashlights in his jacket pockets and keeps all kinds of supplemental lighting devices in his home in case of a sudden blackout. Fagelman lived for decades in horror of his situation. He poured over sacred texts looking for guidance, but no one, not the Rambam, nor Rashi, nor any of the rabbis of the Talmud had anything to say about his condition. Was he alive? In some ways. He moved, he breathed, he read, he ate, and he continued to work at his trade. But living beings die, and he continued on and on. Am I dead? He asked himself a thousand different times. No, because whenever light faded around him, he gasped for breath like any mortal man who does not want to die. But he did not change or grow or decay like something already finished, complete, done. His only comfort 
that he finally had time to read everything he wanted to read. His greatest sorrow, that he left everyone he loved behind as one new year followed another, one decade another, one century followed another, and then a new one began, and a new continent following his people at a distance. Speaking of holidays, what does a vampire eat? You know the other kind, those murderous creatures who all survive on blood, but not Fagelman. For a Jewish vampire, it's the opposite. The sight or smell of blood or any kind of flesh at all, pastrami, a boiled chicken, even a single tiny little piece of gefilte fish turns his stomach makes him sick. No, Fagelman, the Jewish vampire, is a strict vegetarian. Not, not just a vegetarian, but, but a vegan, a person who does not eat anything that comes from any animal at all, not milk or eggs or even honey, which he used to love on a sliced apple, but the smell of which now turns his stomach. And because of his abhorrence for blood and his understanding of Jewish ethics, he can't even make another Jewish vampire to keep him company. And those other vampires, aren't they always dashing, glamorous, beautiful and flowing cloaks and elegant outfits? But not Fagelman. Ill-dressed with a hunch from almost 200 years of being a gem cutter. He still has a way with garnets, which was what he was on his way to Kiev with. Fagelman the Jewish vampire shuffles through the streets of Brooklyn on his way to the subway, to the Diamond District and back again, a book under his arm, living longer and longer and longer in a city illuminated 24 hours a day. It's, you can't really call it living, afraid to make friends, unable to have any pet other than fish or birds, for the smell of cat or dog food he finds intolerable. And just when he begins to settle in and get comfortable with how it is with yard site candles and flashlights stockpiled, eating bagels and kasha and boiled potatoes, someone in the neighborhood begins to notice that the old man on the corner, the one who looks like he's half past 60, has looked exactly that age for years and years and years. And then Fagelman knows that it's time to pack up again, all his books and his emergency supplies. And he moves to a different neighborhood, another apartment. But lucky for him, Brooklyn is a very big city with lots of different neighborhoods and all kinds of different people, the perfect place for a lonely Jewish vampire to hide. Is it okay to clap? <laughs> I believe it's okay. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Uh, let's see, so we have about half an hour. Do you like Fagelman? Okay. Um, another Fagelman story. Um, did anyone not like Fagelman? Don't be shy. My feelings will not be hurt. But you're getting another Fagelman story anyway. It's called A Time for Everything. Fagelman looked out the window at a smudge of distant red rising up over the rooftops in the east. He turned out the light and flung open the window. The air of Brooklyn was still sweet. A bus, its diesel engine loud in the stillness, came around the corner and headed down the street three floors below. Anyone here from Brooklyn? Ancestors from Brooklyn, you got a Brooklyn light, yeah. Yeah, in my little lexicon of realities, I always say that the real promised land of the Jewish people is Brooklyn. 
where I live for longer than anywhere else. So we're back to Fagelman. He looked out the window, the bus. 283 years old today. He said to himself as he filled a tea kettle with water and put it on the stove. As he took the coffee grinder down from the top of the refrigerator and reached for the tin of coffee beans. Dark, earthy, rich, the smell rushed up into his nostrils. That ground, that store-bought coffee, fat, he said out loud, turning to a kitchen table covered with books, piles of books, which made a curved wall around the place where he liked to sit to do his grinding, leaning in to inhale the even richer fragrance. Time to move again. That Mrs. Kravitz down the street has been staring at me for months now, but avoids me when she sees me on the street. She knows something. How could she not? I've been here almost 20 years. Over the sink was a mirror. He turned to look at himself, no longer surprised. A man a bit over 60 stared back at him. His wife, dead for more than 200 years. His children gone even longer, those four beautiful babies who died in infancy or early childhood. His last surviving relative, his first cousin, Marka Bryna, had died in 1802. Along with his wife, his children, his parents, his siblings, he still lit a yard site candle for her every year. You know what a yard site candle is? It's a memorial candle that Jews burn on when someone dies and on the anniversary every year of his death. And most Jews don't realize that the Eastern European Jews borrowed it from Catholic churches. So thank you for that little gift to our culture. So Fagelman lit a yard site candle for his wife every year, though he was alone and had been for far too long. When the tea kettle started whistling, whistling, Fagelman got up and made himself a small pot of coffee, glad for the morning. With Jewish vampires, everything is different. Darkness exterminates them. They have to be in light all the time. Natural light so much better than artificial. And blood, the mainstay of those other vampires, fat. Even though he'd stopped going to shul, synagogue, Decades ago, blood isn't kosher. No, he lived on coffee, tea, bread, vegetables, rice, some barley, and a few potatoes, if living is what you actually call it. Unable to sleep, what could he do? Fagelman had been reading for more than 200 years, sitting alone and reading, first in Europe, now in America, still cutting and selling gemstones to survive, and always and always alone. As he sipped his coffee, he said to himself, yes, it's time to move again, but where should I go now? Maybe the other side of the park, more and more Jews are living there in those fancy neighborhoods. Some more coffee, a bit of a stale donut from a box on the table. Suddenly, Fabelman remembered and recited out loud King Solomon's words from the Bible. A season is set for everything and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time for being born, a time for dying, a time for planting and a time for uprooting the planted, a time for slaying and a time for healing, a time for tearing down and a time for building up, a time for weeping and a time for laughing, a time for wailing and a time for dancing, a time for throwing stones and a time for gathering stones, a time for embracing and a time for shunning embraces, to which he added, and a time for moving, a time for moving again. After his little breakfast, he walked down the car to the corner and picked up the paper. Back in the kitchen, he read through the rental listing, circling in green pencil the ones that sounded promising. And knowing how long it took him to pack and move the last time, Fakelman ventured out again later to the liquor store down the street, where he asked for and was taken to the back of the store where the empty boxes were kept. He took and carried as many boxes as he could 
without anyone getting suspicious of his strength, for packing the few articles of clothing he'd accumulated, the few personal possessions, and the thousands of books that filled every inch of space in that six-room apartment. It was hot. The other kind of vampire, the Gentile ones, don't sweat, he noticed in his rare encounters with them. But Fagelman, the only Jewish vampire ever, sweats like, pardon my choice of words, a pig. Ty pulled down in 1986 when very few other men even wore them anymore after work and no longer even wore them often there. Fagelman's white shirt, sleeves rolled up on hairy forearms, was black from sweat. He stopped on the third landing to look out a grimy window onto an alley crisscrossed with clotheslines, everything hanging limp in the heat. How many places have I lived in? He asked himself, continuing down. Five, six, maybe eight since I've been in America. Squeezing up against the wall so the damp Mrs. Switkus from the top floor could pass, clutching her two shopping bags. A fine day, she said testily. <coughs> A very fine day, he muttered back. First Europe, now America, another move every decade or two at most. Fagelman sighed. Can't stay put too long. People wonder. Why doesn't he look any older? Older, I'd give 200 years of looks and every ounce of my unnatural power to live for more than two decades in one place or just to die like everyone else. Putting the flattened boxes down in the hall, Fagelman went into the living room where rows of books towered in stacks, some of them nearly to the ceiling. You ought to open a store. Little Juan Martinez, who lived across the hall from him, had said the one time that Fagelman invited him in to give him a picture book to replace the one he left on the bus. Fagelman heard his mother yelling at him about it as they came up the stairs in her heavily accented English that Fagelman, with his own heavy accent, loved to listen to. How you talk flows like water, he once said to her when they met in the corner market, embarrassing her and endearing him to her forever. Unlike the Lidfax across the street, the Martinez family had only recently moved in and hadn't guessed yet and wouldn't now have him long enough as a neighbor to begin to wonder. A time to pack, a time to unpack. Fagelman muttered as he unfolded a box, found some packing tape, sealed up the bottom and began to empty one of the towering piles into it. A slim, crumbling volume made him stop. The book was almost 200 years old. Dust drained from the spine when he opened it. In faded ink, a kind of Kabbalistic exercise. Kabbalistic, Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. So Kabbalistic would be a kind of mystical process. A kind of Kabbalistic exercise were pages of his dreams. They filled half the book and then stopped. Fagelman read the first entry written in a small tavern, a day's journey outside of Kiev, two nights after his transformation. Not that he needed to read it. He'd memorized the entire volume more than a century before. I am holding a newly cut garment, garnet in my left hand. My father is standing beside me as if he were still alive. This is first rate, he says, smiling. Fagelman closed the volume and put it on the cardboard box. Then he closed his eyes and imagined himself writing a new dream into the book. Since he hadn't slept in more than two centuries, all he could do was daydream about dreaming. It is night. I am traveling in a coach to Kiev. An old man gets on when we stop to change horses. He makes me uncomfortable. He has a strange smell. I turn to the driver and tell him I'm not feeling well. 
that I want to spend the night in the inn where we stop to change horses. He takes down my small trunk from the top of the carriage. I pay him and go into the inn where I ask for a room. The innkeeper's wife leads me up the narrow stairs to a cozy little room beneath the eaves. I pray, undress, get in bed and fall into a deep, delicious sleep. But as you know, it didn't happen that way. He stayed in the carriage, the vampire leaned over, a single drop of blood dripped onto his hand, garnet red. Only a stone in the road spared him from death and kept him preserved in a state he called a half-life. Long before nuclear scientists began to use those same two link words to describe other phenomena. Another few books in the box. Then Fakelman paused to think about the first vampire film he'd ever seen in the days when television was still new, when he decided to get one, not that he watched it much. No, books were better. Until then, he'd never seen a movie. Afraid there might not be enough light in the movie theater for him to, to what? To live, survive, endure, exist, go on. 200 years had passed and he still didn't have the right words to explain his condition. He thought about those other vampires, the ones in the movies, and the few that he'd met prowling the streets at night, exulting in their freedom, while he sat huddled over a candle, then a reading light, knowing that just a few moments of total darkness would snuff him out. What a terrible waste. Another Jew, a brilliant man, would revel in his chance to study forever. To me, it's all unfathomable. Why me? Why this strange existence? I wonder, I work. Sometimes I tutor little boys, but have no fear. Those other vampires, relish blood, flesh, are not fagal men. My only pleasure is to read. All children are safe with me. Unless they bang a shin, scrape a knuckle. And like those happy others, blood makes me cringe. I am alone, ruthless, year after year. My only tie to home is a piece of soft sandstone I carry in my pocket. We Jews, when we visit the cemetery, we leave a pebble on the grave as a marker. This stone in my pocket, marks my final unresting place. A husk in constant motion, an animated corpse, a walking grave, myself, my unself self. How are you doing? Only 48 more pages. Take a breath. Coming to the end. Physically tireless much stronger than his appearance might suggest. Still, Fagelman found himself emotionally weary, weary of packing, weary of taking the subway to the other side of Brooklyn to inspect apartments till he found one that he liked. A large, high ceiling department looking out on Prospect Park. Yes, weary, and he found himself doing something he'd never done before. Maybe I shouldn't have hired him. He said to himself over a bowl of kasha varnish goods. Remember what that is? It's buckwheat with little bow tie noodles in it. Maybe some fried onions and kind of mushroom gravy sometimes or just butter, yummy. Maybe I shouldn't have hired him. He said to himself over a dinner bowl of kasha varnish goods, thinking of the bookstore clerk he'd gotten to know in the small shop in Manhattan where he'd sell another precious volume when he needed extra money, as he did now for the move. It was a smile, a little crooked on the right, the slant of his left shoulder, as if all of him were leaning into the world at a slight angle. Yes, the smile was achingly familiar. He told him, I have over 30,000 books to move. Some of them are very valuable. All you have to do is pack. This is what he didn't tell the handsome young man in his late 30s, his true age. 
if age is the right word for a vampire, or the Jewish vampires struggle over strange desires just as do the other kind, but that remembering Leviticus and being a vegan, neither his slim handsome body nor his blood were in danger. So you may all know that there is a verse in the Bible in Leviticus that says it's an abhorrence or abomination for a man to be with another man. And then I think in the next chapter, it says, and if they do it, they shall be put to death. So having once been an observant Jew, Fagelman is remembering that verse. And since again, the other kind of vampire could just you know, drain your blood and Jewish vampires can't drink blood, this young man is safe. End of footnote. Why tell? Why not be just that older man moving? His name was Kyle. What kind of a name is that? Fagelman wondered. Kyle Jacob Moskowitz, with his big hazel eyes and that sonorous voice. Trey, sweet for a prize. Kyle said when Fagelman offered him a first edition of Byron's first book of poems, Hours of Idleness, originally published in 1807 and worth $5,000. Wishing for the first time that he was one of those other vampires, the guilt-free Gentile kind, so that I could take him in my arms, that goofy boy. <laughs> goofy in the American world I like a lot. To bury my face in the left side of his neck, inhale. Boy, more forbidden than shrimp or pork or lobster. All of which I would eat now, if I could. So, you know, if you keep kosher, you can't eat anything from a pig or lobster or shrimp. Way easier if you're Muslim, you have a smaller list of restrictions. Which I talk about with the part of my family that is Muslim. But of course, because we get to drink alcohol, they don't. But that's a different story. Uh, but back to the story. He didn't take Kyle in his arms. Old habits die hard. Habits of fear assembled over 200 years. But once a month, Kyle came over to play chess with him in his big new apartment with his glorious view of the trees in Prospect Park, lush green, then coral, rust, amber, vanished. One day he said to him, You have a Beautiful voice, Morris. You ought to use it. Fagelman shrugged, sensing him, feeling him, understanding his new old friend better than he understood himself. Kyle Moskowitz, soon to turn 35 and fast at work finishing his first novel, invited Fagelman to join him once a week, reading to hospital patients in Manhattan. And after a few weeks, Morris Fagelman, who was once Moses, once Moshe, started to go every night. Shuffling and scuffled brown shoes, Fagelman descended the subway steps in his, high, in his neighborhood in Brooklyn and entered the graffiti-covered train. Seated, his right hand slipped into right pocket of brown wool pants, worn at the knees, then inside left pocket of shabby black overcoat to check for flashlights. Another habit. Once he was caught in a train that stopped between stations and all the lights went out. He began to gasp for air a few moments later and became the hero of the train when he pulled out his flashlight and turned it on. Unlike the other kind, Jewish vampires crumble and decay without light. And Fagelman was still struggling with the question he'd been asking for 200 years. Am I alive? In which case, terminating, terminating my existence would be a sin? Or am I dead? In which case, entering darkness and completing the decay I felt when that happens would not be suicide, but rectification. With no rabbinic Talmudic Jewish precedents to follow and no rabbis to turn to to answer his most pressing question, Fagelman continued on and on and on, sort of like a golem, but not like a golem at all. No, a golem. Anyone know what a golem is? 50 extra points if you tell us. In Jewish storytelling, you know, do you want to tell us what a golem is? Go for it.
Beautiful, thank you. You got that? There's some historical evidence that the Jewish story of the Golem actually influenced the writing of the very of the first Frankenstein story. Did you know that? Uh, no. Yes, possibly. So now you know what a Golem is. So here's Fagelman back on the train. Okay, so reaching into the station, swimming his passengers onto the platform and sucking in new ones, the D train slammed shut its many mouths and slipped back into darkness. As Fagelman climbed the piss reeking litter strewn steps toward fading end of day. Socks damp, he scurried toward St. Vincent's AIDS ward, where Kyle had taken him for the first time. Since Jewish vampires never sleep, as you all know, and he was tired of endlessly reading to himself, Fagelman began his nightly ministry, hands tenderly on one of their hands, reading to ravage once beautiful young men with rage and fear and death, their fate too soon, that he continued to avoid, evade and envy. And there in a strange way, he found comfort in giving comfort, who wasn't really alive, but who couldn't die either, found solace and an unexpected kind of healing. There was always someone awake. And since he never slept to the amazement of all the nurses, Fagelman stayed all through the night going from room to room to sit with anyone who was still awake reading. Only when dawn rose up over the city and then turned into another morning, did he make his way home. When he got out of the subway in Brooklyn, he passed a man who was the same age as he appeared to be, 60. The man was wearing a tweed jacket with one of its arms, armless sleeves pinned to his shoulder. And he remembered those years after the war, the Second World War, when the streets were filled with returning soldiers, mangled, shell-shocked, grateful to be alive, some, and glad to be home, some. He passed them on the street, wondering where they'd served, wondering what they'd seen, and if they'd seen the atrocities done to his people. How strange to be undead, a Jewish vampire, so undeserving of his half-life, going on and on and on, while mothers and fathers and joy suffuse children perish. And then shuffling up the street, the last of the leaves turned amber, umber, and fallen. He passed children, little children in their cobbled together costumes. A little girl was coming toward him dressed as a witch, her costume made from an old bedsheet dyed black by her mother, wearing a tall, pointed hat made from construction paper. And then he saw a little boy in one of his father's old undershirts, a baggy black undershirt painted with spattered white bones. That little boy was carrying a small plastic jack-o'-lantern in his pudgy little hand. For a moment, a heart clenching moment, Fagelman remembered Avna, the only one of his presaged children to survive infancy, but not longer. And how do I, a Jewish vampire, engage with other people's attempts to sanctify death? Morris Fagelman asked himself. And is there a way for me to share in their joy at playing dead? Just then he passed the neighborhood bookstore closed for the night. In the large plate glass window beside the door, he caught a glimpse of his face, somber beneath the Hamburg that had long gone out of fashion. He thought about the custom of covering up mirrors when someone has died. He thought about Kyle and the way he'd look up at him from time to time, smiling his goofy, handsome, slightly lopsided smile. And Fagelman found himself thinking about the words that Barry had sent to him that evening. Barry, one of the young men that he read to. I always liked older men. And on this night that for him was different than all other nights, Morris Fagelman knew that when he got home, he would sit down in his overstuffed armchair surrounded by books and pick up the telephone and call Kyle Jacob Moskowitz and ask him out to dinner. Thank you all so much. Some 
my, my, all my students need to leave now to go meet with their elders. But not everyone who's my student, there's other people in the audience who are here and you're welcome to stay for, for some questions, for perhaps a shorter story. But without further ado, I wanna send you to off to be with your elders. Uh, Eli has been an elder, so he, he appreciates that precious time. And I'm just so glad you could experience his storytelling, some of his newest stories. Talk to your elders about them. Have they ever heard of a Jewish vampire? And you can tell them some of the things you learned about this one and only. 